Grüße. Ich habe große Ehre, Sie begrüßen und auch unser Freund und äh, Gast, Professor Wetz, vorstellen. Professor äh, Wetz äh, ist, ist ein äh, ist ordentlicher Professor an der Medizin Fakultät Universität von Wien. Er hat viele Jahre im Institut für Europäische Gesellschaft gearbeitet und viele Artikel veröffentlicht und so weiter und so weiter. Und er ist ein Person wie andere von, der, von dem Institut. Das war Professor Dieter Simon, Michael Stolleis, Thomas Simon und so. Und ja, viel Spaß mit dem Thema. Milos, du bist an der Reihe, ja, danke. So dann, thank you so much for introducing me so kindly. Nina, thank you so much for organizing this perfectly. So, dear students, uh, I'm a bit concerned. I mean, it's Friday night, 7 p.m. I know it's raining, but still, I mean, you're here. Uh, I thought, you know, Belgrade would be the European party capital, but you came to listen to my very long and boring talk. <laughs> so I'm happy that you came. I'm very happy to see so many young faces uh, interested in comparative legal history and many more other things. Um, thank you. Uh, so I try to make my best. You know, when I had lunch today with Nina, she was um, telling me in confidence, you know, there were people here that talked three and a half hours. I said, I'm not prepared for three and a half hours, but I will try my best to be the record. So let's see if what I can do for you. Um, I'm very happy to be in this faculty because this faculty has been a family talk from my childhood on. Uh, when my father started to study in Belgrade after World War II at another faculty down the street, they said to him, if you have no clue, if you have no idea about anything, if, if you are totally incompetent, if you don't know, for example, if you even don't know what is the power of one of zero, that is a very easy calculation if you do mathematics, okay? If you don't know this, there is a building down the street, and that was the law faculty. So if you have no competence at all in hard sciences, you're a jurist. So this is a story uh, that was very long with me and my family, and very many years later I understood the real core of this story, that there is somehow an opposition between engineers, my father was an engineer, and jurists, because engineers have a very strict understanding of truth, and jurists are very flexible. It's all about interpretation. <laughs> and maybe you have heard of this sentence, words may be carved in stone, but their meaning is not. So we are constantly renegotiating the meaning of sentences and laws. So this is what brought me tonight to Belgrade, and I'm happy um, to have this talk to you. And because I'm not a good speaker, I have many slides for you. <laughs> uh, so let's start. So, uh, may I ask you something? Is here anybody in the room who is 22 years old? Who is 22 years old? I cannot believe this. <laughs> Nobody's 22. Are you all younger than 22? Some of us are older. Some of us. Okay, some of us are older. Okay. Unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. Okay. So when I was 22 years old, and I was a law student in Frankfurt, I was sitting in the secretary of my criminal law professor, and he came in, and he came in with the sheet and said take care of this sheet, of these sheets, six sheets. So this is a very complicated story, but it was a, not a turning moment of my career, but it was a very interesting moment. So first of all, why was I sitting in the secretary of a criminal law professor? 
because his secretary had killed her lover. <laughs> and she was sitting in jail. So then the dean of the faculty said, okay, your secretary is in jail. You will get immediately four students doing her work. I was number four of those students, and number four means really I was the least competent of them. I couldn't do anything like a good secretary. It was about typewriting. I was totally incompetent. But, you know, sometimes good things happen out of this incompetence. And he gave me a list, and he said to me, please take care of this list. Organize these titles. This is the original list. And I kept it for many decades because it was a shock for me. This list, he said, is from my old teacher. And he would like to have some journal articles. And these journals are probably not so easy to get, but you have time, you know, he meant I was totally useless for other things. You have time, take care of this. And it was so complicated because, you know, these journals were, you can't read it here on the slide, but it was like Journal of Q&A Forum Studies. Harvard Review of Biblical Studies. I have never before in my life heard that, you know, the academic world is so specialized and it's so big. So it was like a shock for me how big the academic world was and it was really a surprise. And I thought, this is very strange. I mean, how can a jurist be interested in such stuff? So when I had this list, I put on the first sheet the name of the professor I was organizing these titles for, and his name was Preiser. So in one moment of my life, at the age of 22, I was working for this man. But we never met. I was organizing these photocopies. I handed it to my professor, and he handed it to his, so to say, professor. Yes. So, you are asking yourself, I mean, you came probably, I'm very sure, nobody of you have heard of Pfizer. So I brought some pictures. You see him here as the baby. You see him here um, at the age of 28 or so, I think. And here uh, he is, I think, in his mid-30s. In his mid-30s, there was a real shocking moment in his life, I'll come back to this later, um, which brings me to the issue of sources. As you can see, I brought many, many pictures. You know, you can't see, but you can guess. I have childhood pictures, I have uh, other pictures. Um, for giving this talk and writing actually a book about this, Wolfgang Kleiser, I went to, I think, four or five different archives. I consulted archives in Frankfurt, Wiesbaden, Berlin, in the Netherlands. Um, I referred to printed material, you know, his writings, his books, his reviews. Um, and um, most interestingly, you know, I started to ask people, have you ever met him? And that was very complicated, but, you know, as you can see, no, you could see on the previous slide, he was born in 1903, and he passed away in 1997. So he had a quite long life, and it's quite likely that you will meet somebody, um, even now in the year 2023, who had, you know, a talk with him. So the longer I talked to people, they were directing me to other people and saying, ah, I, I never met him, but you can ask him. So finally, I ended up with having oral history. I collected like a dozen uh, oral history sources, interviews on the telephone in presence with people who were <coughs> family members, scholars, and most interestingly, students. Students like you, you know, you come to a lecture hall and then there is a guy uh, looking at you, speaking, giving a talk, and you think, what is this about? How is he behaving? What's he dressing like? You know, what is his t 
teaching style and so on, and then you get very old, and then somebody calls you and asks you, you know, in the year 2023, in then Belgrade, can you tell me something about the Belgrade law faculty and the teachers and so on? And you can say, oh, and then, so this is my story, what I did uh, in the last one and a half years. This talk would not have been possible without this person. Uh, this is Christian Preiser, a historian. He's the younger son. He's more or less my age. I visited him in his home uh, like two months ago, and he's sharing a lot, you know, of the family archive. So he gave me photographs, letters to his father, from his father, and that was <coughs> of tremendous help for me. So that, that is how, you know, I collected the material. And it was actually big fun. I, you know, you feel like a detective and you call people and say, may I ask you, you know, uh, you are now 85 years old. You are now 90. The oldest person I talked to was 94 years old. And I asked them, you know, what do you remember about when you were 18 and you went to law school in Frankfurt? So these people were really a, a very interesting source, but as you can imagine, there was sometimes very few interface between what they said about, you know, how it was back then in the old days. Okay, so who is Pleiser? What, why I'm talking to you about this Pleiser guy? Should you know him? So, you know, what jurists usually do when they are short of better arguments, they refer to authority. And I'm referring to authority, and my authority is Randall Lissafer. Uh, he is a very eminent um, scholar in the field of international legal history. He is the main editor of a book series which come out in the next years. The book series is called The Cambridge History of International Law. It's with Cambridge University Press, CUP forthcoming, and he is taking as a general editor uh, of the whole series, then there are sub-editors for individual volumes, and he has written something about, you know, uh, the way to a global history of international law. So this is a piece which already exists, and in his introduction to the whole book series, he writes, among the comparatist historians of international law from the decades after the Second World War, the German Roman lawyer Wolfgang Preiser may be ranked first. So we have here uh, somebody who is ranked first by a real authority, and I'm quoting the real authority. I have a question. I'm, I, maybe this is very unpolite to do, but you will feel relieved in a second. I know there are Roman lawyers here in the room. I'm not looking at them directly. But Valentina, <laughs> <laughs> have you ever heard of Wolfgang Preiser? No. How come? I mean, you're a brilliant scholar. You have not heard of the, the most important comparative Roman lawyer. No, not comparative. Okay. Have you heard of Wolfgang Preiser? No. Nine. Nine. Nobody has heard of him as a Roman lawyer. So what is the solution? This is the solution. So my colleague Randall Lesafer, an uh, eminent professor in Belgium and the Netherlands, has made a mistake. And the mistake is a very frequent, uh, a, a mistake made very often by my colleagues. They mistake him for a Roman lawyer because he was partly, you know, friends with other Roman lawyers. One of his, you know, pupils was an eminent Roman lawyer. So everybody thinks he was a Roman lawyer, but he was not a Roman lawyer. Sorry. <laughs> um, but still, he, so he is ranked first. And um, in the perspective of historians of international law, and there is a comparative perspective on that. 
there is another joke here or another very interesting and weird point because everybody thinks he's a Roman lawyer. There was a Portuguese journal approaching me two years ago and they asked me, Professor, you're a historian of international law. Can you write something at the 25th year after he passed away about him? Because he was a Roman lawyer. And I said, sure, I can do this. One year later, I did a lot of research. I found out he was not a Roman lawyer, but I gave them the manuscript about the, his life, so to say, with the pictures, you know, the archival work, with the oral history. And they said, okay, uh, we understand he was not a Roman lawyer. Okay, however, we will print your manuscript. It's a good manuscript. So this is in print. It's a Portuguese journal, um, Interpretatio Prudentium. And this is my, so to say, the initial point why I started to do this research. And it was about, you know, coming from out of a mistake. Uh, very strange. And I have a colleague um, who is working now at the University of Helsinki, Gustavo, who translated my original German to uh, Portuguese. Um, so, um, Randall Lesserfer took the motto from Wolfgang Kaiser for his Cambridge History of International Law. And before you read anything in this book, there will be this statement. General legal history is, for good reasons, concerned with all legal developments of the past, regardless both of where they appeared and also whether or not they prevailed over the long term. So the legitimation is extremely open. Legal history can be about any time you know, any place, and it does not matter if it prevailed over decades and years. So that is what he obviously liked and took as a motto for the Cambridge University Press um, project. So this is the outline of my talk tonight. I will try to introduce you to the basic facts of his life, as you can see, uh, with a lot of portraits, family pictures, and other things. I'd like to, that you are a bit familiar with his main writings. Uh, then, you know, I talk to those uh, dozen Frankfurt students. I'd like to give some, how can you say, gossip, how he was in class. If you ask me, um, I will tell you the gossip. And uh, my main point is that you understand his intellectual and moral aims about uh, legal history, because he had also such moral aims. And I would also, first of all, introduce you to the fact there is, so to say, uh, a, a rediscovery of Wolfgang Kleiser, and I'd like to explain to you the reasons why they are rediscovering him. Okay, so let's start with his family. Um, this is, you know, Wolfgang Kreiser, the family in the year 1903. He was born in February. Here he looks like a baby of a couple of weeks. And he is here with his older brother, Erich. He, this Erich uh, is a quite well-known national economist uh, in Germany. Probably he is the better known guy um, in comparison, but you know, I, I can't say anything competent about national economy, so I took Wolfgang. Um, here is the whole Preiser family in 1910. There is also a younger brother. Um, he later became a doctor. The parents, of course. Um, as you see from the whole setting, it's something like a middle-class family. Uh, Wolfgang Pleiser's father was a teacher in Frankfurt Goethe Gymnasium. Uh, the about the mother, I do know very little. Um, and they were all dressed in these navy uh, suits. You know, the the German, not only the German, but you know, many many civil societies were crazy about that militaristic. Look, they thought it's very fancy before World War I. 
but World War One cured them uh, that they believed this is a very good thing to to be enthusiastic about the Navy. But it was not full, fully cured. They, you know, they started the Second World War also with the Navy and the submarines. Okay, so this is the family. <coughs> The family background, here is Wolfgang already in his youth. Maybe he is something like 13 or 14 years old in the 1910s. And then he receives after World War I his high school diploma. He goes to the school where his father is teaching. I don't know if that would be also your preference. Uh, I think sometimes it might be a not so nice constellation if your father is teaching you at school. Um, but so he has his high school diploma and then he decides to go to the local university. This is Frankfurt University and Frankfurt University is very young at that moment. As you can see, it was only founded in 1914. Frankfurt is a city which is strongly influenced by banks, civil society, um, and it's not a very noble, you know, um, how can I say, old style, old fashioned, traditionalist university, but it was more modern, um, fresh, and so on. I don't know if he found that attractive. At least, you know, he starts to work, no, to study, in the year 1922, and for uh, earning a living, he starts to work at a banking house. He interrupts his teaching to earn some money, then he starts again um, to study law, but also art history, and he goes to Munich University. I don't know why he went to Munich University. So his son said to me, you know, Munich, party, you know, very, if you're interested in skiing, sports, and so on, maybe it's more fun than in Frankfurt. I have no idea. Um, I'm like, you, you can hear from this, if I may say this in a his, more serious way as a historian, I'm lacking sources. It's a thing of speculation. I have no diary. He kept no diary. So if you do me a favor, write a diary and give it to your children one day so that professional historians have something you know, to do, otherwise your life is open to speculation. <laughs> um, and finally, he returns to Frankfurt and then in the Weimar Republic, he makes his first state exam, gut, that is gut, gut means in German, in the German scale of marks, excellent. So you belong to the like 10 top percentage uh, of your academic year. And the same with the second state exam, it's also good. And in the combination of both, this is really a very good performance. You can see him here, he's a cool guy. Um, you know, they are having fun with cigarettes. <laughs> he was smoking most of his life and uh, when he was not smoking, he gained some weight as you will see in other pictures. So he studies law, he's finished, the future is open. What shall he do? So I would like to know, but I really don't know in detail, what was his mindset at that time. I'm lacking sources. Um, I know he has an interest in legal history. Why do I know that? Because there are very few books preserved which he bought and possessed. So you can see here a general constitutional and administrative history he bought in 1925. Probably this means I bought this in that year. Um, and it, this book still exists. Otherwise, I don't know what he read at that time. I have no inventory of his library. I have no record like, you know, a sketchbook, what was inspiring me. I don't know if, you're, if you have such a sketchbook or so. Um, but one can imagine, you know, other people have notebooks or so as you, for example, and for, or, or you may maybe type it in your mobile phone. I'm reading this, I want to read this. That was, you know, really interesting. I don't know. But what I do know is, 
that he has not only an interest in uh, legal history, but also in criminal law. Um, I don't know if this is the next slide. No, this is the next slide. That's interesting. This interest in legal history stretches out very far to the past. So you can see it's Oriental law and the Greek and Roman law. And Oriental law, you know, you study this year also the law faculty. This is pre-classical law. It goes very far uh, to the past. So he was in touch with this. And if you read this book, so I organized this book, I tried to you know, understand what was in his mind when he read the book. You can see that treaties, very early treaties like peace treaties, peace treaties about you know, how to end a war or so are already mentioned. Maybe this was, you know, also an inspiration for him. I'm not sure. Um, I can only say he has also an interest in... Uh, okay, these books were part of a very big project. It was called The Culture of the Presence, Die Kultur der Gegenwart. And it was like a, a big encyclopedia issued, organized by the most eminent scholars of the time. However, let me return to my former statement. Um, Preiser has definitely an interest in criminal law. He has already also a supervisor. This supervisor is named Bertolt Freudenthal. This Freudenthal guy is quite interesting. He comes from this school, Franz von Liszt, a nephew of the composer, actually. I don't know if you know this. And this Franz von Liszt school has an interest in empirism, facts, and how facts interact with the law. I don't know if that was also inspiring him to develop an interest in legal history. But you can imagine, I mean, if you're a lawyer and you're interested not only in norms, but you're interested in, in facts, it's not so far to go to legal history, because legal history is a lot about facts, you know. That happened and that happened, and here we have a problem of implementation, and this did not work, and so on. And there was, you know, uh, issues. Okay, so <coughs> Bertolt Freudenthal is his potential supervisor. But Freudenthal has a problem with his faculty colleagues, they are bullying him because he is of Jewish origin. I don't know in how far he is living his Jewish religion, but at least, you know, they are bullying him very aggressively, and he dies early. He dies already in 1929, um, so the plan to write a dissertation in criminal law is definitely over. Um, here you have another of these, you know, party pictures with friends and cigarettes and so on. So this is Pfizer here with the cigarette. Um, that, this is Battle Freudenthal. I could not find any better high resolution picture of him. Um, as you see, he died in 1929. And then Pfizer is creative. So he dismisses the plan with criminal law and he decides to write a very practical-minded thesis about banking law. So please, I put this into deep L. Don't nail me on that translation. Maybe it's, if, if anybody of you is into banking law, it's maybe totally nonsense. But it's something about the transformation of capital associations into personal associations. So that is a very tiny booklet of something like 80 pages or so. And he defends this thesis in early 1931. He has two people being his reviewers. There is Friedrich Klausing and there is Franz Beierle. This Franz Beierle is interesting. So he comes to Frankfurt, I think, in around, at um, 1930 or so, I think. 
And he is a liberal modernizer in terms of legal education. He makes some kind of colloquium. So he includes students and he says, look, we are planning to modernize. I want to know what you think. I want to know what you think. And my assistants will be there and my faculty colleagues will be also there. So he was very much anti-hierarchy. Uh, hierarchies and really open-minded in terms of how to do, you know, a reformed teaching of law. Franz Beyer, a legal historian, offers to Preiser, he says, would you like to have a habilitation with me? You could do something on the legal structure of the medieval city economy. Preiser says, yes, that would be my plan, but then comes Hitler's takeover in 1933, as you know, and the expectations on law professors shift immediately. So if you want to be a law professor at the university, you have to teach now different things. There is no unpolitical teaching in a dictatorship. There is no unpolitical teaching of law in a fascist system. So if you want to be a law professor, you have to go to some kind of training in Lager. So they were you know, putting all the law professors together and they're doing exercises and ideological you know, training. And this is very strict and there is a lot of pressure because the new system wants to have you all. You can't say, you know, I'm a private person here and I'm only a law professor here. It goes all into one totalitarian mindset. Okay, so these are new expectations on law professors, plus the two people who gave expert opinion on his dissertation, they have conflicts. So I talked about Franz Bayerle, but the other guy is maybe more exciting in a very dark way. This is this guy, Friedrich Klausing. I don't know if you studied Lombroso. I, I, maybe you can read from his face that he is a hardcore Nazi, okay? <laughs> so this is, this is not um, Klausing, this is Klausing, and uh, this is again Kreiser. But this Klausing guy, he is at Frankfurt University, then he goes to another university for two years, he comes back, and now, you know, with Hitler's takeover, he's in power, and he's a real Nazi, and he wants to transform the whole faculty into a Nazi faculty. And there were quite a number of Jewish professors at Frankfurt University. So, oh my God, here is a format um, problem. So. He, um, he, Klausing, becomes dean, and he tries uh, to reform the whole faculty. Franz Bayerle also wanted reforms, but different reforms. Even worse, Franz Bayerle tried to help people who were prosecuted by the Nazis, who were harassed by the Nazis, so he gives money from his private pockets to those people. He hides these people in his country house, you know, in some kind of remote forest area in Germany. He helps these people to escape from Germany. So this is totally against this closing plan, and they have conflicts and if you can imagine, uh, Preiser is somewhere in the middle, and he, he doesn't know what to do, and uh, Bayerle finally then leaves for another university, so he's gone, and Preiser is without somebody who would supervise his habilitation, and there is only Klausing left. This has nothing to do with the talk tonight, but you know, this Klausing guy, he had a son, and ironically, his son was one of the men who tried to assassinate uh, Nazis in Prague. There was a big terror attack on the Nazis in 1944, 
The son was, you know, put in front of the Volksgerichtshof. He was sentenced to death, and then the SA came to his father and said, now you have to show on which side you stand. And this is really true. They say to him, we expect you to commit suicide. So that is life in a dictatorship. And Klausing, you could read this nearly, he commits suicide because he is such a convinced Nazi and they said to him, if you don't commit suicide, you, go, you will go to the Eastern Front in Russia. And that means also some kind of death threat. Okay, so Pleiser has a bleak future in the 1930s. What should he do with his talent and his life? He decides to join the party. On May 2nd, he becomes a party member of the National Socialist Democratic German Party. After 1954, he writes a justification. He writes, there was a democratic burden on me. You know, I was a democrat and now things are changing. That would not be so easy for me. Plus, I had the concern for economic uh, existence. This is why I joined the Nazi party in 1933. I don't know in how far you know, that had an impact on his career, but step by step, you, you, as you can see, he was a judge in Frankfurt, then Wetzlar, then Wiesbaden, and finally in Mainz, partly without being paid. That was the system at that time, um, but uh, he, now he's earning a living. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to ask, if he had Jewish origin, how is he even allowed to join the party? He, he had no Jewish origin, only, you know, the Freudenthal. Freudenthal is su potential supervisor in criminal law. Um, Kleiser was from a Christian home. Probably one could say he did not care much about this religion in a very strict sense. So, but, you know, he, uh, okay. oh, sorry, thank you for asking, thank you for clarifying, that always helps. Okay, so you see him sitting here in the 30s, and things in the 30s are progressing. Um, here in 1937, you see him skiing in Pontresina with four unknown women. He's, maybe he has some fun, and it looks like there is some kind of normality in his life. I don't know if you're familiar with legal theory of fascism, but there is the theory of the so-called dual state, Ernst Frankel. Ernst Frankel was a lawyer in Berlin in the 1930s. And he said, you know, the Nazi system is a dual state. There is terror and there is normality. If you have a problem, you know, with a dog, with a pet, if you have a problem with a car, you may go to court and you may encounter something like a normal court system, you know, but if you are a Jew, if you are a communist, if you are a liberal, if you are a social democrat, if you are a socialist, if you are something like, you know, the enemy of the system, you will face terrorism. So this is the theory of the dual state. There has been a lot of discussion, if that is correct, because this terror and normality are intertwined in a authoritarian, in a fascist system. You can't separate them. So it looks like there is some kind of normality, but terror comes back to his life. There is the Night of the Broken Glass, November 9th, 1933, and his best childhood friend, he is in fact a Jew, Hans Jacobius, is deported. They take him into the so-called Schutzhaft, um, and they take him to the concentration camp, Buchenwald, and friends and family try to release him, you know, from this concentration camp, 
but they are not successful. So Hans Jacobius dies in the concentration camp, and you see the two guys here performing music together, maybe in the 1920s, maybe in the 1930s, and it's, he says, that was um, a shocking moment of my life, um, and later says I, that brought him not only to despair, but he is not able to perform classical music anymore. So that was such a horror trip for him. Um, somehow it does not proceed. Yes, go ahead. I have a, an extremely unrelated question. You mentioned that he liked classical music. Uh, do you know maybe which composer, probably? I have no idea. The, the only thing I have is this picture. And I'm, you know, it's, it's very low resolution and I don't have any more. I'm sorry. No problem. Okay, so what, it, what remains of Hans Jacobius is this so-called stumbling stone. You know, in Germany they, they are putting these stumbling stones in the fronts of the houses of people deported and killed in concentration camps. So the son of Kleiser organized this so-called stumbling stone, and you can see it today in Frankfurt. It's like that. Um, okay. So Kleiser has no normal life within terror, um, but for some reasons I cannot decode, so to say, he returns to university. Um, he starts teaching at the law faculty in 1940, little courses, I don't know why. He continues to study art history in 1940, and he finishes this art history studies with a dissertation. And this dissertation is about the art academic thought. The art academic thought you know, in Italian Renaissance. And there in this book, he is looking in how far this idea was pure when they implemented it, or if it was contaminated by, you know, for, um, other influences. Um, he is looking for the autonomy of art. He is looking for true science. So you, when you read this dissertation, you feel he wants to escape from this politicization of daily life. It's about purity. It's about you know science and art. Not politics shall not be everywhere. Uh, so it's somehow he's looking for shelter in the year 1943. And in the year 1943, he also starts with plans for a new habilitation. So it looks like there is not normality in his life, but to, to use a word I learned in the pandemic, there is something like a new normal maybe in his life. So we, sh we adjust our um, assessment what is normality under extreme circumstances. So is there a new normal in his life? Clearly no, because the German authorities sent him to the occupied Netherlands, and they make him a judge there. Can you imagine what that means to be a judge in an occupied country, which kind of cases you have? So he is responsible, first of all, for the German national living in the Netherlands. It's not so complicated, maybe, because, you know, they are not so harsh against, you know, at least not in the year 1941. Maybe after the fall of Stalingrad in 1943, you know, this explodes and they are terrorists. Um, uh, it's a terrorist justice. But he is also responsible for charges against Dutchmen. Dutchmen being charged with acts directed against the occupying power. So if somebody, you know, imagine you're a Dutch person, Imagine you're a Dutch person in the Netherlands and you say something, oh my God, we have another shortage and it's all about the Führer. 
and somebody hears this and there is a denunciation, you go to court. And then they will say, he is obstructing our occupation, and they will send you probably for a very long time or a life sentence to jail, or even worse, the SR or SS is catching you immediately and executing you. So many things can happen under Nazi occupation. So this is really a problem for him because he wanted to escape from this Nazi constellation and now they're sending him to an occupied country. What is Pleiser doing as a judge in this occupied country? Um, he tries to escape and he says, I'm ill, I'm sick. Please let, allow that I go back to Frankfurt. And in fact, they allow that he goes to Frankfurt and they send him back to the war damage office. And he works for the last two years before the end of World War II in this war damage office. The Netherlands are an awful political system at that time. You see here Arthur Zeiss Inquart, he's an Austrian Nazi. And he is taking a parade in The Hague in 1940. You know the fate of Arthur Zeiss Inquart? Have you ever heard of him? Goodbye. Uh, so Arthur Zeiss Inquart was brought to court at Nuremberg and he was sentenced to death and executed. He was really one of the main um, perpetrators of the hor horrific crimes of the Nazis. So, how did, what did Pfizer do then? He is charged after 1945 that he is an offender because he was part of the occupation regime, he was a judge, and he was working for the Nazis. So, they say, you're an offender. But he's acquitted, and he belongs to the persons exonerated. And that is, in this US American zone, only 3%, only 3% give, give, have that stamp. What happened here? Pleiser has Dutch or Jewish friends, and they testify for him. He has letters, they say, we don't know how he managed to help other people. You know, he was a judge. He always tried to do the best in court for our Dutch countrymen, for our Jewish friends. And we, we can't understand that he was never um, detected uh, in his acts of resistance. They even say resistance. Very interesting. So this is also a sec very important section of his life. I'm lacking a bit sources, but there are three types of sources I have here. First of all, the Dutch court files are digitalized, so I can see what he did as a judge. Interesting. So there is a written record about the procedure and the sentence. Secondly, I have official ego documents. So after 1945, he, you know, he wants to have a normal life, so he is writing CVs and explaining, you know, I joined the party, but uh, I would like, I am a jurist, but, you know. So he's explaining his life for authorities, for American and German authorities. So I have something, I think, nine different CVs from a very short time. Plus, and this is the most fascinating document, there is an essay from 1976 where he tells the story how people tried to avoid written records of their acts of resistance. So he says, we wanted to help the accused Dutch citizens but of course, we knew that there was always somebody from the Nazi party sitting in courtroom. And we were afraid, you know, that they could send us somewhere. So we had to perform like we were 
in line with the party, but in fact, you know, we try to save people. Like we sent the files to one office and the office said, okay, we have to wait. And then they send the, the files back after four months. So they try to avoid harsh sentences. Or sometimes they put people into jail to save them from the SS. Okay, so that is what he said. And he said, all that I'm telling here is not in the files. Very interesting constellation for you and me as legal historians, because it says the written files are basically only part of the truth or a lie. Okay, so these are his years. <coughs> and then he starts a university career. He writes a habilitation in um, the history of criminal law dogmatics in the 19th century, unpublished. Not very interesting, but he is against Hegel, power, state, and so on. He becomes very soon an extraordinary professor for life. Uh, he receives a call, like this one, uh, from Saarbrücken University. They say, we'd like to have you as a full professor. And in that situation, Frankfurt University says, look, uh, we need somebody, and Preiser is here. So the ministry in Hessen says, he can become, he can become an ordinary professor in the year 1954. And in that situation, he's very clever and strategic. He says, look, Dean, I have a personal inclination in the subject. And this subject is history of international law. Please ask the ministry to give me an institute for the history of international law. This is, you know, my hobby. It won't be very expensive. And, you know, I don't need much, but I want to have this institute. And the dean says, okay, uh, Wolfgang, I need something like a letter from you, and I hand it to the ministry. And in that situation, you know, he takes a lot of time to write this letter. So he's not very fast in writing, but finally they both submit this letter. And the ministry says, okay, so Preiser has his own institute for the history of international law, and he is, so to, so to say, a director of this. So the institute is more like, you know, a title and not much behind it. Um, but it's a, nice, it's a nice idea. He is sitting in this main building of Frankfurt University, uh, somewhere in these rooms. I cannot say in which one. And what is he doing with this institute? He gives not many talks, not many. I, I have a list of his talks. In some years, it's one or two talks. Uh, that is the average amount, not, not much more. He buys a lot of books. <laughs> Interestingly, these books are what you call today coffee table books. So when he retires, the dean asks, Wolfgang, where are your books? You bought books for a lot of money. And he says, well, the books are at my home. You know, I'm a professor. And the dean says to him, okay, we want to have the books back because it's the taxpayer's money. We want to put the back, books back in the library. And then he sends somebody to the car and they bring the books back and the dean is shocked because it's all coffee table books, a lot of pictures, you know, Iraq, uh, Morocco and so on. So it's not, you know, learned science. So, uh, interesting. And he invites colleagues and friends. So he says, okay, you are interested in this. Uh, you're a theologian, you're uh, interested in ancient Orient and so on. Come to give a talk at my institute. I don't know much about these talks, about the activity, but Preiser is quite strategic and he says, I want to write a two volume history of international law. He approaches a publisher in 19. 54, and says, would you like to have a book from me about the history of international law? The publisher says, well, we have somebody under contract, but this is, you know, more than 10 years ago. Uh, maybe th that book won't appear. It appeared, in fact, uh, I think in 1985. So the Preiser book 
This one is the one that never appears because he is very lazy in writing. He's very slow in writing, as many of us academics. So he, is, he plans to write this you know, textbook on the history of international law, uh, but he is never finalizing it. And also, very interesting, Preiser has a chair for criminal law and international law. So these are his two subjects. But he's not writing. He's not writing about positive international law, and he's not writing about the dogmatics of criminal law. He is only into history of international law. So everything is about his hobby, so to say. Um, and um, also, he makes a lot of excur excursions. I don't know when he bought this fancy car. He has a black beetle convertible and he drives with this black beetle convertible to Africa. So he, this is him with his assistant. So he drives with his female assistant, Eva, uh, to Morocco, to the Atlas Mountains. Later, uh, he gives a PhD to Eva, um, he, and he marries her. <laughs> um, so, I don't know about you know, his travels in detail, but interestingly, he has been to many countries of the Near East. He has definitely been to Morocco. He plans to go to Moscow, but that does not work out. It's the Cold War, and Russians are so complicated to arrange you know, a, a, a conference. And so he says, I don't want to go there anymore. And already 1946, he says, I have, I have at the age, you know, uh, of 40 or something, traveled to most, to almost all countries in Europe, to some of them about a dozen times each. Very interesting. So he's very active in traveling, and also he takes his other assistants with him on those journeys. Okay, so what is he doing intellectually with his interest in history of international law? He's publishing about international law of the pre-classical antiquity. I don't know if you have seen this stone. Anybody of you have seen this stone? Yes, somebody says yes. It's, it's very famous. It's from Mesopotamia, the, the ancient Near East. It's the stele of the vultures. Two city-states have a conflict. One is winning, and he, this city carves into stone that the people losing the war are torn into pieces, and the vultures are coming and taking the smashed bodies away. So you could say it's not a record of a treaty, but it's a record about conflict resolution and the outcome of a war more than 4,500 years ago. So he has an interest in this pre-classical antiquity. He is writing about the ancient history of international law. He is writing a very programmatic piece about the history of international law, its task and method. And he is nearly pu pushing all his teaching in this field, so he is increasingly, you know, neglecting criminal law. He is neglecting uh, international law and only doing this. There is a Max Planck Institute in Frankfurt. At that time, he has no uh, connections to the institute. So I would say, at that time of his life, he was something like an outsider among legal historians and also the German jurists think. What is this man doing? You know, think about my story about the dean and the books. He is collecting, you know, these book, coffee table books. He is looking, you know, for at the steel of the vulture. Other people say, look, this is not law, it's religion. It has nothing to do with international law of today. You know, you know what international law is today. It is about, you know, the Vienna Convention of Treaties and so on. This is not international law. You are doing something like sociology of religion or so. Okay, so this is Pfizer as an outsider, but there are some statements I would like to introduce to you. So in 1956, 
he makes a very important definition. And he says, there is a system of international law when you have independent states. And they recognize each other as of equal rank. And they have agreements. And these agreements are out of the spirit that people are also legally bound, also legally bound to a certain behavior. OK, so this is his definition. Then, OK, I, I don't know if anybody of you has had a training in German. This is a shocking fact about German. In German, this is one sentence with 140 words. You simply cannot understand it if you read it for the first time. It's so complicated. It's like the Amazon, you know, uh, meandering, and it never comes to an end. So here is a definition, um, and he says, there is a European law of nations, and this European law of nations is very old. It's very old because it starts, think about the stele of the vultures, it starts in the Near East, two and a half millennia before Christ, and with the emergence of Christianity, it becomes more important. And the interesting thing is that there is a continuity. So European law of nations is a very old thing, which is many thousand years old. If you ask Heiser about justification, why are we doing legal history? He says, it's not about usefulness. It can be totally useless, but it is the human desire to know, some, to know how something came to be and why it came to be that way. That is enough. You don't have to apply this. It's a very open uh, definition. OK, so I would like to embed Pfizer for you in the academic post-World War II world. Maybe you have heard some uh, of the following ideas. There is an Austrian, he is writing a book about Europe and Roman law uh, in 1947. So this is something like a founding idea. Nationalism is out, but we are looking now at Europe, and it's Western Europe, the Europe of Christianity, and you know there is a common idea of the law, and this common idea of the law, medieval law, reception of Roman law from you know from the Middle Ages to today, maybe this can be. Uh, you know, yes, I'm sorry. Did he help in any way in making of the law system of the EU general? Nothing. Nothing. He was a totally unpractical lawyer. <laughs> I, I, as, as unpractical as you can imagine. So, there is this spirit, you know, legal history and a new Europe, which goes a bit into your direction. Um, but this is just ideas. Then, you know, there is you know, after 1945, the German jurists, they're constantly writing about the idea of the law. There is the idea of the law. So they're going back in a certain way to natural law. They're very fond of, you know, that there is some kind of eternal law, true law, Christian law. And this, these ideas are also inspiring for the foundation of the Max Planck Institute for European Legal History. Um, Preiser is partly following his colleagues. So, for example, there is a German international lawyer and diplomat, Wilhelm Greve, and Preiser takes up his periodization. The periodization is quite interesting. There is a Spanish age, French age, English age, Soviet American age. So you see there is a lot of power politics in that periodization. But Preiser is against power politics. He just takes the label, and he is totally against empires. Yes, please. Uh, uh, because he was alive at the time, did he react or maybe comment on the Hart uh, Fuller debate uh, about the Gretchen Former case? You are totally right to ask that, but he is totally far from that world of ideas. He doesn't care. 
he does not care about this. Okay. And I give you later some examples how much he does not care about his time, so to say. You will be surprised, maybe even shocked. So, okay, Pleiser is very far from power, empires, and so on. He, but his interest is, so to say, to bring some sociology to the history of international law. So he says, you know, for international law, you need some kind of exchange, you need some kind of spirit, commercial exchange, exchange of ideas, and so on. So you see him with colleagues uh, sitting in the 1950s. Um, but it's not only about Europe and reception of Roman law and tradition, but already in 1959, he says in one talk that the final aim of his legal history or of any legal history should be universal. All phenomena of international law accessible to our knowledge, which we encounter wherever and whenever in the history of mankind. I ask you, where could that be? All phenomena of international law in mankind, where could that be outside of Europe? Would you have an example for me? The United States? United States is not so old, but where would that be before United States? So before 1776. Ah, go ahead. Asia. Asia. Where in Asia could we find something like international law? Maybe in China. So you have a superpower, China, and you have neighbors. Do they have something like? Uh, do, wait, wait. Do, do they have something like you know exchange on equal terms? Yes. Wait. I ask your colleague. Calm down. <laughs> and then they maybe between them and the powers giving them tributes in the tributary system, which you obviously know. So, but Pleiser says you know only among equals. So you need China and some another power which is equal. Where, where else? You have another. You, you raised your hand. Uh, maybe in Mesopotamia. Maybe Mesopotamia. So that is something clearly out of Europe. Where else? What could you say? You, you mentioned the Americas. Where where could we search? Aztecs. The the, the You could Empire. you look you could look if the Aztecs had some kind of external relations. Exactly. Uh, regarding China, Silk Road is a great example of international law. Maybe Silk Road. Maybe you could search for the Silk Road. Okay. So you have some world regions where you could search for it. But this is, that is now too early. Um, I, I'm coming back to teaching, but you're very nervous. So I'm skipping the anecdotes about teaching and save this for discussion. Maybe some of you are a bit busy. But these are the people, I, I put them with professor's titles here, but in the 1950s, in the 1960s and 1970s, early 1970s, they were his students. So Pleiser taught many young people who were later professors, and they are now in their 70s, 80s, 90s, and I had them on the phone. That was big fun, you know, to talk to people at that age and how they talk and how they remember the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So um, this is a, uh, a copy of lecture notes. I managed to have one copy of lecture notes from his history of international law. Um, okay, but I skip this. I, I skip this for later, the anecdotes about his teaching. And in 1971, we are coming almost to the end, uh, he is retiring. The institute is closed. The dean, the rectorate, the ministry, they have no interest in continuing his institute. The successor is a criminal lawyer, and he is not including international law anymore in his chair. And later he regrets, because he says, 
that was such a mistake, you know. Only, you know, 15 years later, there, there is a rebirth of international criminal law with the Yugoslav wars, with the, you know, Rwanda uh, massacre, uh, there is 9-11, there is the International Criminal Court. I was so stupid to put this away. It is now so important. Okay. Um, and Pleiser is frustrated from university. He hates university because there is this 1968 in Frankfurt. There is, it's near to a revolution. It's a student uprise. And the highlights of the student protest is that they are renaming Goethe University into Karl Marx Universität. So he says, you know, I'm surrounded by communists. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you're a conservative German professor with a tie and you have student protest around you, you know, you, you say these are all communists, they want to destroy education and so on. Uh, so he withdraws from the university and he looks for a retreat, he finds this retreat and he continues writing. So three books. First of all, the book we were discussing. It's about early international legal order in the non-European world, a contribution to the history of international law. Then in 1978, the next book, Collected Essays. These are his reviews and essays. Um, and in 1983, there is a festschrift, you know, his colleagues celebrating him uh, and contributing. This is a really interesting book. He is publishing this book at the age of 73. Um, it is based on a talk in 1970. It's devoted to an Austrian international lawyer who had the same assumptions about early international law that it might be all over the place uh, on the globe. And the idea is, let's have a look if there exists real international law. So he comes back to the question, no, no matter where and when we are looking for international law, and what he is doing, he has a checklist in this book from 1976. He says, first of all, we need something like statehood. Then we need to have interstate relations, and then we need relationships of a legal nature. Ah, so maybe there is a formatting issue with the computer. Um, and if you can, could say yes to all these three points, you turn out that there is a genuine system of international law uh, at that time. So he has this checklist, and his chapters in the books are, here you have the list, the old America, so that, that is the pre-colonial America. Then he is looking at the uh, Pacific Ocean, he is looking at the Polynesian Islands. Then he's looking, I translated this literary from his uh, structure, Black Africa, is there Black Africa? Uh, international law in Black Africa. Then there is the Indian subcontinent, did the Mughal states have international law? Did they have somebody, you know, to negotiate with diplomatic relations? And finally, as you mentioned, uh, in the first place, China and neighboring East Asian territories. The outcome of this is the following. Pre-colonial Central America, so not the Aztecs, the Inca. The Inca had external relations with other powers. They had true international law. Kaiser is very happy. Um, the Polynesian islands don't have, maybe because we don't have the sources. They were oral cultures. How can we find out if they had something like an agreement? I don't know. You don't know. Maybe future will tell us. Black Africa, as you say, mixed, as, as, as you can see, very mixed. Partly yes, partly no. The, <coughs> the Indian subcontinent, no international law. China, yes, China had international law in his imperial period. 
Prizo is undertaking massive efforts to promote his book. He asks his assistants, can you write a review of my book? And the assistant says, yes, I will do this. Here you have it, please correct it. Is it okay for you that I wrote it like this? It's a true story, I have it on file. Um, he is sending the book to colleagues and saying, look, this is my book. Can you review it? So this is his expectation, but it works out. So many reviews and they all say he is a pioneer, he is wonderful. And in fact, the reviews are interesting because look at this, I'm coming back to our discussion. When Pleiser looks at this non-European world and says, look, they have had international law, he's so to say in empowering the non-Europeans. He says, look, Africa was not uncivilized or, you know, inhabited by barbarians, but they had something what we would call international law today. They had something like diplomatic relations. <coughs> The book is inspiring scholars to think about, you know, what is law? Because, you know, it looks not like Roman law. It looks so different if you look at the, you know, the Inca, if you look at China. It doesn't resemble, you know, Western international law. So the question, what is law, um, is also inspiring Europeans to overcome European provincialism. So they have new ideas what law can be, and this is not sure, that is why I make a question mark in brackets. You can also think if he, Pleiser, is overcoming statehood fetishism. Maybe there is international law without states. I don't know. If you look at some forms of political organization, it has not to be necessarily states. Some critical remarks, but nobody is following up on his work. That is the year 1976. He is continuing research after this book. Um, he is collecting material. He is asking people for help, like um, Milos uh, at the age of 22. Via his professor, he is overworking publications and then he is giving few academic talks. The last academic talk in 1984. Here you can see him as an emeritus in style with a dark red tie and blue uh, suit in um, Florence in a hotel garden. And no um, cigarette. Is... Sorry? No cigarette. No cigarette. <laughs> ah, sorry, I, I forgot uh, the, the, the story about the cigarettes. Okay. Um, so you can see him here. Um, at the celebration of his uh, 85th birthday, he looks already very old. But in 1996, 1996, he is 94 years old, or 93 years old. He is publishing another essay, and one colleague says, this is his best publication. <laughs> Can you imagine? Um, and in this final sub, uh, publication, he is discussing again this stele of the vultures. Um, and he is looking if there was in Mesopotamia something like a sense of justice, if they acted out in a sense of justice. Because he says, you know, this is what we need for a true international law. He dies in October 19. Uh, 97. This is the final photo I have from him. This is what the family put in Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. His son said to me he liked it because it's unpretentious and unemotional. Very few words, only his titles and uh, the dates of his life. 1997. Very fascinating. You, one could say, ironically, is the year in which the turn to history in international law began. So, at the Mark Frankfurt Max Planck, there is a group of researchers, a very big group, and they are doing research on German international law in the 19th and 20th century. 
many dissertations. Um, the Journal of the History of International Law is founded in 1999. There is a book series with Nomos Publishers in Baden-Baden, <coughs> Studie zur Geschichte des Völkerrechts. Most important, my colleague, eminent colleague from Helsinki, Marti Koskiniemi, a Finnish diplomat and very leading scholar of international law, publishes a masterpiece, The Gentle Civilizer of Nations, The Rise and Fall of International Law, 1860 to 1970. No, it's the other way around, 1870 to 1960. And since that, it's a flourishing field. Um, these people are interested in Preiser because he is for them a forerunner in overcoming Eurocentrism. So he is not focused and limited to the European world, but to the global history. Second point, he has a quite open definition of international law. If the steel of the stele of the vultures is international law, many other things can also be included in international law. I don't know in how far he overcame state centrism, but it's a good point to discuss. Um, he was, during his whole lifespan, searching for true law. Some, you know, you need some kind of true law idea to do that. Some colleagues have made suggestions for other terms. I'm skip, I skip this and might explain this later. And finally, in the present time, he's, in, uh, he's inspiring eminent colleagues. For example, I have a colleague at the European University Institute, um, Becker Lorca, and he would like to do the investigation you suggested. Is there law among the Aztecs? Because he's from Chile, and he would like to know if there was something similar, you know, in their outer relations like international law. I have a colleague from Münster, Julia Bühner. He is inter she's interested in the Canary Islands. And she says, look, different islands, did they have external relations with each other? Was there something like an idea of a taboo in interaction? How about when the Spaniards came? So this is pre-colonial and early, the early colonial encounter with the Spaniards. That's a um, picture of a gathering place of the Canary Islands. So that was my promise for you, my talk for tonight. I hope I managed to um, work on the list. I have two final slides. So, Pfizer in his time, give me two more minutes, or three more minutes, please, and calm down a bit. So, he has lived in four different political systems. He was born in the German Kaiserreich, Weimar, Nazi, and then Western Democratic Germany. He has spread his publications over 66 years, quite a lot. Um, you have to have a very long life, and he had. He had a wide perspective on international legal history. He was never nationalistic, and in that way, he was definitely an outsider for a long time. He was open-minded because he went beyond text. He was not only interested in, in texts, but also in other types of sources. And he went beyond, so to say, the great books tradition. So he did not only take international law from Vattel, Grotius, and the Spanish scholastics. <coughs> With him, discussions were possible what international law really is, which is very complicated. I mean, if you compare today's international law with medieval international law, this is very complicated to match. He was opening historical science to sociology in his field, and he was looking for something like an ethical foundation of this law, because that is my thesis. He never wrote, I come back to your remarks, no, that was you. He was never a very practical-minded person, so he was never in contact with that post-1945 reality. 
but he was also very quiet about you know what happened in the years before. So, but still, I would claim that National Socialism had a big impact on his life because you know he encountered all these things from very different perspectives. He was never writing about National Socialism. You know, there was only this one essay. He was never talking about it. In class, he was never teaching about the history of National Socialism or international law during National Socialism. None of my, you know, uh, oral sources could confirm that he ever said something about the 20th century. However, I would say it was always present um, because he was searching for a better foundation of law and history and in that he was very much an amateur legal historian. He was not a Roman lawyer, he had no genuine training by a real um, his, a historian of international law and at the same time he had some blind spots and anachronisms. I think he had something you might call epistemic Eurocentrism, because he was still looking for, you know, system, statehood, and international order. These were not the ideas, you know, of African kingdoms. They did not claim that we have a system or the Inca. They did not say that we have a state and, you know, a system, a system sorry. Why is this relevant? Because his texts are still present. They are present in the Max Planck Encyclopedia of International Law. You know, this is done by the Heidelberg Institute of International Law, and that is a massive online encyclopedia. It's very useful. I don't know if you have access to this, but if you look at his name, is under the contributors, and he has still written the basic articles about, you know, method of international law and periodization and many other things. So this is why he still matters. Thank you. So, if anybody of you is in a rush, please, you can leave the room now and otherwise we continue discussion. So... I didn't mean that everybody has to leave, okay? I would be happy to have some students here, okay? You two are here, okay, but we need gender balance. I know you have both long hair. <laughs> Nina, I'm sorry, I messed this up. I, I shouldn't have said this. They're all, they're all here. Also, the organic moment, the time it was delighted to see you, and you are really my favorite German legal scholar. I did not hear this. Can you say this again? Can you give it in writing to me in the gold, gold yes. letter? Always. Thank you, Always. Simon. You will have the tape. You will have the tape so you can. Fantastic. You're so kind. So 10 times and as many times you need. Thank you. Sima, we, we, I think the break is over now and we'd like to continue with discussion. Okay? Okay. So, Perfect. Okay? So, I'm go on. Just go on. What would you like to know? Uh, Please, go ahead. I have, I think I have multiple, but three questions. If, uh, should I only ask one or? You can ask three questions. I t I'm taking notes. Maybe there is always the same answer. I don't know. Okay. Uh, regarding to Volkman Kreisner, uh, was he more of uh, someone who believed in uh, natural law or uh, natural positivism? I think he was always looking for an idea of just and true law. So in that sense, he believed in some kind of eternity and natural law idea. It was clearly, I think, inspired by Christian natural law ideas, but it was not so much related to church ideas, it was not related to certain denominations, confessions, and somehow, you know, the longer you read it, you feel it was a quite secularized idea, because he needed to use it 
to, so to say, to oppose the Nazis. Uh -huh. So he needed some kind of idea to say, you know, I'm here a judge in a court, but what they are asking of me is so unjust. I have to counterfeit, you know, the file. I have to avoid, I have to circumvent the law because it's so horrific what they would expect from me otherwise. Uh -huh. So that would be my answer. There is natural law, but it's not a Christian natural law. It's a secularized idea. He believed, he did not believe in positivism. That was not, you know, possible after the Nazi experience, I would say. But if you have any back remarks or questions... Uh, yes, uh, I mean, because he was... Uh, could you say that because he was so interested in the development of international law in the overseas communities regarding to Polynesia, uh, yes. Aztecs, Incas and Mayas uh, in uh, China, uh, could you say that he maybe believed that the idea of justice and law was something what was not a natural development but one could say akin to a, a genetic development in humans that it would come out naturally the same as your beard grows as you get, get older. I'm looking at you. <laughs> your beard is not growing. So maybe it's a very you know relativistic um, question. So I would say maybe he had the assumption that different civilizations might develop something like we would call international law at some point, but empirically he could not prove it. So for Polynesia, this thesis could not, so to say, be uh, proven. There is, uh, regarding Polynesia, there is an example of uh, trade between islands, but I don't think that could be strong enough evidence to back up international law. It's a good point. I mean, when is international law starting? What would you need in case of trade? If we make a trade agreement, the two of us, it's not international. Yeah. yeah. So you would need independent, something like independent communities agreement. Oh yeah, two communities <laughs> trading, but it was totally different. They didn't even use money, they used the big stone circles carved into all the big rocks and yeah. It's a week. My, my exactly. empirical answer would be maybe Prizer did not know this 50 years ago. You know, he wrote this book, he published the book in 1976. So he wrote this in the early 1970s. Maybe he did not know your example. Yeah, probably. Maybe. This I don't know. Oh, okay, thank you. That would be it. And the other two questions? Oh, and those are really less uh, regarding to the presentation itself. Uh, you mentioned that in 1944 the, there was that, uh, that attack on Prague, on the Nazis yes. in the Prague, yes. Is that uh, when they killed uh, Heinrich. Uh, Rein, uh, Reinhardt? Heinrich. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's the instance when they killed him. So the, and his son was the, the son of Klausling was yeah. part of the assassination team. Yeah. You know, your father is a major Nazi and your son tries to kill in, uh, in Prague. So, what a sad story for the father. I mean, good as he killed him. <laughs> I mean, he was a terrible Nazi. Yes. And the Professor, other one. Professor, what are you Sure. Professor. Is it Slavo? Da Alislavo Moisev Srpsko, can you try to do this in English or somebody might translate it? Someone need a translator for the song. Okay. I'll pass it. Nina, Nina, Professor. Awesome, awesome. Do you translate it? Do you translate it, Vladimir? Ovaj, prvo odlično predavanje, profesore, ovaj, sve poslove, i samo sam teo jedno pitanje da postavim. A naši profesori sa ovih prostora koji predaju u Nemojčkoj, Zeljim Drugovama, Francuskoj, o njima niste govorili. Imate li takva saznanja? Mnogi su u opišenju. To, 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 to
ti izpozvali ovaj izvora. Znači, ovdje je odrani presentaciju u Srbiji i Crnoj Gori. Ne budu izboru, izboru zvanje, pozovu ga u SAD, različku Nemačku, Britaniju. Jasno, jasno. Ovaj, I tamo ovdje, ovaj, i imate takva saznanja. Eto, to je bilo i radi i da danas tako radi. So if he thinks you have an interesting lecture, if he's interested in a slightly off-topic question, do you have any interest in information of this kind, of some professors of origins from here, Serbia and Yugoslav origins, who went to Germany or the United States or somewhere like that? Why not? M- many thanks. That would be nice, Vladimir. Do you understand? Oh my God. <laughs> Okay, hvala mnogo, Oma. So, I'm looking at you. Anything more you would like to ask? To You also can just comment on this. If not, I'm... Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, well, I'm curious about, uh, about the books that he published in, uh, later in his life. Uh, you mentioned that there were some bad reviews in them. Like, what people said that it was bad about his books? Ah, that, that is a very interesting and a bit complicated question for me. So, you know, there were his edited, the, edi- the collection of his edited, no, the edited collection of his essays. There was not much to say about this. Nobody reviewed this as far as I know, um, and it was quite positive when they reviewed it. The book about, you know, the non-European world, that was intensely reviewed. And some of them, you know, some of these people, they made very tiny remarks. They said, you know, there is some detail wrong or so. But in general, they felt, you know, inspired to, to think further, to expand their imagination, what law is, what the concept of law is. I mean, is this law? if you have something like an agreement about, you know, stones in Polynesia or so. Is it law when you have something, I, I'm making not examples from his book, but from other sources. If you have an agreement about blood brotherhood, for example, in Africa, is this international law? So th- this is why I think, you know, Pleiza can help to discuss the concept of law and what international law is in a time where the word international law did not exist. Maybe you know this, the word international law is only from 1789. Jeremy Bentham invented it before it was called law of nations. But he said, you know, it's better to call this because it's about international law. It's about the between states uh, world and not the law of all nations. So, very few critical remarks, only about details, no fundamental attack. I'm not sure. As I said, you know, he orchestrated also the reviews. He gave a lot of efforts, you know, to people that he liked and he assumed that they would like his book or so. And also, you know, there were very few people competent in what he aimed at because he was not, he was not an expert in Polynesia. And the people, you know, an expert on Polynesia could review this book, but he could not understand the other four parts of the book. So that is why he was very ambitious and a pioneer. And if you're a pioneer, you know, sometimes people say it's not relevant or it's out of scope or so. So that was, I would say, uh, the overall picture. He had, in, during his lifetime, I mean, if you, if you put out that book of the whole panorama, he had little resonance, I would say. You know, he had only one pupil who, went, who would later be a professor and a historian of international law. Um, he had, you know, a couple of PhD students, not really many, if you compare it, you know, to mass production uh, with other professors or so. So I would say that, so, this is why I'm saying, you know, he was an outsider of mo- most of his life in the academic world, because that was so far away, you know, from his colleagues who did constitutional history, criminal law history, civil law history, Roman law reception. That was much more, you know, the, the, the spirit of the time. Yes. 
Go ahead. I also wanted to ask a bit off topic, but that protest that happened in, on yes. the university where the where basically they renamed the whole university the Karl Marx like um, faculty. So what was no, like university? Not only faculty. Sorry, but university. university. Yeah, my bad. So what was like? How, what was the point of all that? I know it's a bit off topic, but I just can't like my I can't put my finger on it because it just seems it seems more that they were taunting the school for being like Marxist or like uh, communist rather than like doing it for like their own image. It's it's a very important question, and I'm happy that you're asking. Look, this is the year 1968 in Frankfurt. If you look transnationally, there has been a year 1968 in Prague, so that was protest against a communist system. There has been the year 1968 in Tokyo, that was protest against the building of a new airport, very important Japanese, so to say, environmental civil society protest. There has been 1968 also in other countries, like in France, they were close to a re revolution, the end of the republic. And there was 1968 in San Francisco, that was civil society uprise, equality of gender, race, uh, origin. So that, that was the transnational spirit of 1968, and it was different in all of the countries. I don't know about Belgrade, but I would wonder if there would not be, you know, people with long hair, beard, carrying some protest signs, or asking for a new direction in art and thinking about society. So I can only talk about West Germany here, and I try to focus this on your particular question. If you look at West German law faculties, the 1950s and 1960s, you were, you were a student at that time. Many of your teachers would have been Nazis. And you would have known that because their, their writings were on the shelf. You could read what they were commenting like, you know, on uh, the anti-Jewish law, on the Führer, how they were commenting, you know, on the warfare uh, in Russia. So you could see that they have been previously highly anti-democratic, authoritarian-minded, against liberalism. And some of them were, I mean, also there is the gender component. You know, there are a few women here in the story. That was a very male repressive system. And now there was this flower power spirit of liberalism, you know, um, and they wanted to have their share of it. And it was against the press. It was against the university because the professors were not like your professors. Yeah. They were very authoritarian men, you know, and they were asking you sometimes to be also very authoritarian if you want to pass the law exam. Mm -hmm. And all that's, not, not all, but a remarkable share of that generation, they felt, you know, the system is so unjust. They saw colonial war in Vietnam. You know, they saw in the later uh, 70s other wars, and they said, you know, the capitalist system is wrong, you know, the Americans brought freedom maybe to the western part of Germany, but there is still an issue with our civil rights, with the constitution, and we need, you know, an opposition which is out of the parliament, and that was the idea. We have an opposition which is not represented in the parliament, but from the street. We are protesting, they are shooting us down, they are putting us into jail, they are telling lies about us, what, what was in effect, they were telling lies, and this is why we need to reform the educational system, rename the university, new methods at the university, new topics at the university, alternative university systems. And, you know, the generation did not vanish, but some of them withdraw. And there were new laws, you know, how the law exam would look like. There were new laws, what is teaching, and there, were, there was a new generation of professors. They were more liberal-minded, some of them were a bit even leftist, 
and part of the whole generational enterprise and part of the socialist, you know, attack um, and part of this, you know, Marxist idea to reform the law. I think that was a very long answer and I hope I've covered, you know, your question. Yeah, yeah. Also, the thing that you mentioned about Japan, the, the airport one, like who? Narita. The, that was Narita Airport in Japan. So go ahead. Yeah. Who was behind that? Because, like, I doubt it's the Communist Party. No, no, it's not the Communist Party, but there were young people, you know, acting out of a spirit of, you know, save the environment. They had some kind... If you look at, you know, at Japanese movies, they had a sense, you know, that we are perverting nature. I mean... Yeah. Probably one of you has seen Godzilla. Yes. You know how oh, yes, Godzilla, yes. he comes out of the ocean because of the nuclear bombing. You remember that? Yeah. So it's, so to say, a, a counter story against, you know, what happens if you drop nuclear bombs. Yeah. And also look at, if, if you, maybe some of you have seen the wonderful Miyazaki movies. Yes. Uh, for example, it's also about the, the idea of, you know, there is a holistic, uh, the, the, the philosopher, Japanese Yukio Mishima, wrote about uh, the reduction of uh, human societies due to the diverging from the natural paths. Exactly, but there is an issue with Mishima, just many, mentioning. Many, many. Okay, many. many. Okay, sorry for... Uh, but, yeah. Um, w what is this, uh, the, the Serbian title of the story about um, the mining, uh, not y y uh, the manga, uh, the um, uh, anime movie from uh, um, with the, the girl with the blood blooded face, Princess Mononoke. Mo Princess Mononoke. It's it's it, like it's, it's, it's more or less the same. So that, that I'm so happy you know this. It's such an inspiring movie about you know also um, empowering women. You know, it's, of course, it's, it's about her um, leading the protest. Sorry, ten out of ten, by the way. Sorry? Ten, ten out of ten, by the way. Why not eleven? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Thank you. Jeez. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, are you familiar maybe with the North American Iroquois Federation, the, the, one of the first international law documents from the North American continent where in the northern part near the 13 colonies, the six tribes uh, made a first probably international federation in the sense because loosely using the word national because those were not yes. nations in modern sense but later exactly. The, exactly. Uh, the, but what's interesting there recently uh, there have been some claims uh, that the that European Federation also inspired the American legal system. And are you familiar with that? Zoran, in my first training as a teacher, that was many years ago, my teacher told me there is always one person in the room who knows more about the topic than you know. Be careful what you say. <laughs> so today, in that sense, you are the person who knows more about this. Uh, I'm not familiar with that treaty, but I know that they have been, you know, you could see them as political entities forming some kind of a union. I'm hesitant to follow the claim that this was inspiring the Founding Fathers. Same. This is David Graeber and others who are claiming this. I'm, I don't believe this. There are, I mean, there should be something like a record. We have abundant records for other things. I'm a bit hesitant if that is so. But what we do know is that, you know, when the, the so-called First Nations met at the first time with the white settlers, they were concluding treaties on equal footage. I don't know if you have ever seen the Treaty of Montreal from the La Grande Paix from 1701. And they were concluding a treaty with Indian, not Indian, First Nation symbols and terms. That is a fascinating document. So, sorry, that, that, that's, you know, that is my, so to say, icon for that First Nations had some idea about, you know, agreements. 
and exchange and so on. And now, you know, that is Kleiser's question. Is that real international law? Or is that something else, like it's just, you know, an agreement? Uh, like, maybe we should try to define what a nation is in the first place. What's you think that helps you out of the dilemma. I say it does not help you out of the dilemma. Because then you have the next problem, is this law? So, this is, you know, I come back to one slide I skipped previously, and um, maybe... Ah, sorry. Um, with that one, just go back. Just share it back, because they removed it so you can see schema. Yes, thank you. Ah, okay. Uh, I'm going the wrong direction. Okay, so this is my suggestion for you. Have a look at the slide. Heinhard Steiger, a colleague from Gießen University, said maybe it's misleading to call that international law. Maybe we should talk about interpower normativity. Maybe this is a solution. Probably. I don't know. Lauren Benton and Adam Clulo said in 2015, let's talk about interpolity law. It's not nations, you see it's polities, so it's like, you know, in Mesopotamia. <laughs> Maybe it helps. Yeah, also the, the fact that modern concept of nations is a relatively new thing. It's and so new. Also statehood. I mean, you, yes. you cannot project statehood to, you know, 4,000 before uh, Christ. Modern German statehood was formed uh, in the middle of 19th century with, uh, after the Napoleon conquest that my right. That's, historically speaking, that's practically yesterday. So, yeah, it, we, we cannot apply modern concepts to things that happen. But you so have, I mean, choice. that is also a modern concept. Interpower normativity, they did not speak about interpower normativity in Mesopotamia. You know, when they erected, you know, when they carved the limestone, they did not say, look, we have a treaty and it's interpower normativity. So it's all a projection. Yes, yes. You're correct, thank you. I mean, there, it's, you have always new problems if you shift to a new term, but sometimes it's helpful to consider the new term, but there is always a blind spot. It's just about, you know, being aware of, of the blind spot. Sorry, you raised your hand. Uh, you, met, you mentioned he wasn't a Nazi, but I wondered, was he maybe led by some other ideology or bigger idea? I don't know if I said literary he was not a Nazi, but I believe in a wider sense he, he, I did not found, find any trace of any Nazi thinking in his work and life. And he also said he wasn't a Nazi. Yes, he, he said that, you know, but many Germans said that after 1945, <laughs> you know, uh, that might be shocking to you, but many of them were in fact Nazis from head to heel, if you could say I know, so. I know. So, but I come back to the sources. You know, the, the point is he went, he joined the Nazi party and he served as a judge in the occupied Dutch territories. So that, that would be, so the, um, the pro. And I, I feel, you know, he had some judgments which were harsh but they were not extreme. He said, you know, we tried to avoid the worst thing that, you know, the SA, the SS is catching, you know, the, the Dutch people. By, and we are doing that by putting these people to jail. So th this is a complicated thing and probably we'll never find out because you would need oral history you would need, you know, survivors testifying, you know, what, what really happens, you would have to ask him or so. It's complicated. But your question was more complex, and uh, I see your point. You were asking if there was something like another ideology. Yes. This is complicated. <clears throat> I feel, you know, he was a part of 
of a bourgeois, middle-class civil society. He identified himself with history, music, certain lifestyle, and after 1945, he was probably also anti-totalitarian. So he knew what dictatorship could mean, and therefore he said, you know, my personal ambition as a jurist is that should not happen again. And this is why I want to educate my students that there is something like a true spirit of the law. And we can find the true spirit of the law if we look at First Nations, because they believe, you know, we have this treaty and we are, we are complying with this treaty not because it's good for us, but because we have signed it. And he was so much against this power politics idea that he excluded the Roman Republic after it became an empire from his teaching. So he said, you know, when the Roman Republic is an empire, it's so dominant, there is no place for international law because there is nobody on equal footage. Which, you know, my colleagues from uh, imperial history would say this is, you know, crazy because you're producing a blind spot. You have to look like how empires behave with their neighbors. You have to look at, you know, Nazi Germany, at the Roman Republic. You have to look like what does imperial China do with their neighbors in the tributary system and so on. But this is, so I cannot say anything about political parties, this I don't know, and otherwise, you know, he was a conservative man in his 50s, 60s, yeah, more, I have no more sources for more details and more accurate answer. You were first, sorry. Uh, what? Damn it, I forgot what I was going to say, sorry. <laughs> don't worry. Good night, thank you for coming. Late, maybe we should... I, I, I have one last question. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, Dina. Do we know why we disagree with Hegel? Yes, because, because Hegel was, you know... Somebody forgot something? No. Uh, yes, because Hegel was the apologetic thinker of the power of the, the state of positivism, so to say. He was acclaiming, you know, that things are good as they are. And he had the doctrine of the error in criminal law, which was against the ideas of the Enlightenment, you know, the autonomy of the individual, the responsibility of the individual. And he identified Hegel as the enemy who was against enlightenment at that point. Mm, that's interesting. Because, you know, you need to have somebody... If, you, if you're living in a society of autonomous individuals, there has to be the possibility that you don't know the law. And Hegel said, no, he's excluding practically this possibility, and if you make an error like you, you think you're complying with the law and in fact the law is different, it's your problem, not the problem of criminal law and the state. So this is why he was against the Hegel doctrine. Okay, thank you Nina for reminding you that I'm over talking your students. Thank you for coming and for staying.